Hey folks, Ben here from the Bring Back the Salmon program. Welcome to Classroom Hatchery Television. Bring back the salmon. What is a salmon? Which salmon are we bringing back? Where are we bringing them back to? And why are we bringing them back? A salmon is a type of fish. And a fish is a living organism, which of course is different than things like my car, a rock, or my guitar. A fish is an animal, which of course is different from other living organisms like plants, fungi, and bacteria. A fish is a vertebrate, which means that it has a backbone, which is different than invertebrates that have no backbone. Things like insects, spiders, and worms. A salmon is a fish, and a fish is different from other vertebrates like mammals. I'm a mammal, you're a mammal, that bear and the seal are also mammals. It's different from other vertebrates like birds, like this barred owl. It's different from amphibians like frogs and salamanders, and it's different from reptiles, lizards, turtles, and snakes. A fish is a cold-blooded animal that lives in water. It has gills so that it can breathe underwater and usually has fins for swimming and scales. There are over 34,000 different living species of fish that have been recognized in the world and there are still many more yet to be discovered. In Ontario, there are almost 150 different species of freshwater fish. Fish like largemouth bass, channel catfish with its long whisker-like barbels, yellow perch, walleye, long-nosed gar with its pincer-like mouth, common carp, the large predatory muscalunge, and northern pike. Lake Ontario is also home to several different species or types of salmon. Some of these, like coho salmon, chinook salmon, and rainbow trout, have been introduced from the Pacific Ocean. The brown trout was introduced from Europe. There are also several species that are native to Ontario, which means that they occur naturally in Ontario. Lake trout is native to Lake Ontario, and brook trout is native to the streams and rivers that flow into Lake Ontario. The salmon that we are bringing back is this species, the Atlantic salmon. This here is Sandy. And like the other fish that I was just showing you on the wall, Sandy is a replica made out of fiberglass. Sandy is a replica of the largest Atlantic salmon caught in Lake Ontario in recent years. For thousands of years, there were lots and lots of Atlantic salmon like Sandy swimming around in Lake Ontario. But in the late 1800s, for several reasons, they completely disappeared. The Bring Back the Salmon program, also known as the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, is bringing back Atlantic salmon to Lake Ontario and the streams that flow into Lake Ontario. Classroom Hatchery Television is part of the Bring Back the Salmon program. What we are going to do is we are going to put a hundred Atlantic salmon in each of these two tanks behind me. Hmm, I might need bigger tanks. Just kidding. We aren't going to put fully grown adults into the tanks. We'll put Atlantic salmon eggs. We'll do that in our next video. Then we'll watch the eggs develop, hatch, and the little fish grow. Along the way, we'll learn lots of interesting things about this fish. Their life cycle, habitat, how and when they came to Lake Ontario, how they were lost, and how the Bring Back the Salmon program is bringing them back. Here is our classroom hatchery equipment. First off, we have a tank, and of course the tank is going to hold the water. Atlantic salmon start out their lives in cold water streams, 
And so, of course, in the natural environment, that's going to be the stream bank that's holding the water. Next to it, we have this chiller. And Atlantic salmon are cold water fish. So they need the water to be quite cool. This unit acts kind of like a refrigerator. Those coils are going to sit inside the tank and that's going to take heat out of the water and drop the temperature down and keep it nice and cool. In the natural environment, cold water comes out of the ground and into the stream. Trees are super important in keeping the water cold by providing shade. It's got a dial on it that we can adjust and get the temperature just how we like it or how the fish like it actually, I guess. We have a thermometer to help us monitor that temperature. Next, we have some gravel. And in nature, Atlantic salmon eggs are laid in a nest called a red. And the gravel helps to protect the eggs from predators. When the eggs hatch, the little fish can also hide in there from predators. For our classroom hatchery, we use these incubating trays, also known as a condo, so that we can watch the eggs develop in there nicely. This here is an air pump. The air pump has a tube on it and this air stone. And what this does is it adds oxygen to the water. Fish need to breathe and they breathe through their gills. So this is how we're gonna add air to the water. And we have our filter. So the filter keeps the water in the tank clean. In nature, this is done through biological processes of plants and animals. Plants and animals work together to help to keep the water clean. And we have a pile of insulation and the insulation is going to go around the tank and that is going to keep the tank dark. In nature, in Ontario, the cold water streams would, in the winter time when the eggs are in the gravel, it's going to be really dark because of ice. The ice is covering the water and helping to keep everything dark. So we're going to try and mimic those dark conditions. We're going to plug everything in to this power bar. And this is a ground fault circuit interrupting power bar. And this one is designed so that if it gets wet, it turns off. And you know, we have electricity around water, so we have to be careful. And this is a safety feature that we do not want to skip. Now I'm going to go ahead and put all of this together. unit is set up. I'm going to set up the other one. All right, so there's all the equipment set up. Now our next step is to put water in the tank. Now I'm going to use bottled water and that's because I want this water to be really good and clean. You can use tap water. However, a lot of tap water has chlorine in it and chlorine can impact the health of our fish. You could put chlorinated water in there and let it sit for about five days and let it dissipate, but I am going to just make sure that we've got the best water that I could find. And so I'm going to now fill up these two tanks with the water. Well, there's both tanks filled with water. So up to this point, the power has been off. We don't want to run the equipment without water in the tanks and everything is in place that we can now plug these in. And you'll notice that our filters are not functioning. There's going to be a little waterfall coming out of them as it pumps up water and through the inside to filter out the water. 
So that's because there's air in the filter. So this is called priming. And I'm just gonna add a little bit of water into the filter. Into that one. And into this one. And you can hear that the chiller's running and we can see the bubbles coming out of the aerator. So we know we've got the air going, the chillers are on, and we're gonna set this one over here, we're gonna set this to four degrees Celsius. And this one over here, we're gonna set to seven degrees Celsius. And we're gonna see how the temperature, that difference in temperature, affects the development of our fish. Then we have our thermometers as well, and they just stick to the glass on the inside here. There we go, one of them. Little suction cup on them. And two. And there goes our filter. Now it's running, a little waterfall going through there. And this one's running as well. So everything is set. I'm gonna turn the dial to four degrees and then to seven degrees. All right, our equipment's all set up. Now I'm gonna come back in here every couple of days, make sure that the equipment is functioning properly, that our chillers are running and our temperature is where we want it. So four degrees and seven degrees, that the air pump is running. We're getting lots of air into the water and that the filters are running. So I'll do that every couple of days until we get the eggs in here. Before I sign off today though, I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. My name is Ben Teske. I was born and raised here in Ontario. As a child, I loved to play outside, especially in the forest. And as an adult, I love to play in the woods just as much, if not more. I canoe, kayak, hike, hunt and fish. My keen interest in the natural world has brought me to amazing places, both here in Ontario and in other parts of the world, including deserts in Australia and South America, mountains, and into the heart of jungles, including the famous Amazon jungle. I've had jobs working with plants, birds, and people. As a certified scuba diver and an avid snorkeler, I have seen fish and the world they live in up close and personally. My most amazing experience with fish and one of my most amazing experiences in nature and in my life was a few years ago off the coast of Honduras in Central America. My main reasons for being in Honduras were to track wildlife like tapirs and jaguar and see the amazing birds in the jungle and to dive on the Mesoamerican reef which is one of the largest reefs in the world. The reef is made up of many different types of corals and home to a huge variety of fish like moray eels, barracuda, sharks and rays. It's also home to sea turtles and jellyfish. One of my dives, which is this extremely amazing experience that I mentioned, was a shark dive. I got on a boat with a bunch of people that I didn't know and traveled out into the ocean to a small reef. Here the boat tied to a mooring line attached to an anchor. We put on our scuba gear, leaned back on the side of the boat, and dropped into the water below. The water was rough that day, and as we were being washed back and forth, we swam to the mooring line, where we started to descend into the ocean below. As I followed the line, hand over hand, I could see about 10 to 15 sharks swimming below me. Something that you need to understand about sharks is that while some sharks are extremely dangerous, few of the over 1,000 species of sharks view people as food. The sharks I was seeing in the depths below were Caribbean reef sharks that are up to around two meters long. Once we got down to the ocean floor, which was about 21 meters below the surface, we swam around with the sharks. We were given very clear instructions not to touch the sharks. And I'm usually a rule follower especially if I understand and agree with why the rules exist, like if there's safety concerns. 
and a two meter long shark with rows of razor sharp teeth is a good reason. But at one point I had this shark swimming right over my shoulder and I looked over and I saw the guide looking another way. And then I looked back over and I saw my hand and it was like it had a mind of its own and it was reaching up towards the belly of the shark. And I thought, am I about to touch a shark? Like how often do you get to do that? And just as I thought that, the shark's body went up and pulled away from me. And then I thought, well, I guess I'm not touching the shark. But then the shark decided to touch me and it swung its big tail over and it smoked me right in the side of the head. It was so awesome. And it made me even way more fascinated by the world of fish. After high school, following the recommendations of one of my favorite teachers, I went to college for electronics and then almost immediately got a job in that sector. It was an interesting career and if electronics interests you, which I'm sure it does some of you, you can have a great, interesting and lucrative career in it. However, after a few years of getting to know myself, my interests and my skills better, I realized that electronics was not where I should be. I then enrolled in Fleming College's ecosystem management program, which I absolutely loved. And I learned about ecology. From there, I purchased a lodge on the edge of Algonquin Park, where I hosted guests from around the world and helped facilitate their experiences connecting with the natural wonders of the park. After nine years of owning and operating the lodge, I sold it. And then I've worked a variety of contract positions, teaching outdoor recreation skills and nature identification skills, maintaining some natural areas and doing some conservation work, including inventorying birds and plants and fish in Ontario and also up in the Arctic. Now I work at the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters in the Bring Back the Salmon program as the Atlantic Salmon Educator. No, I don't teach Atlantic Salmon how to swim. I teach people about Atlantic Salmon and about the Bring Back the Salmon program. In 1928, a grassroots alliance of conservationists joined forces to become the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Today, we are the province's largest nonprofit charitable fish and wildlife conservation organization. Together with our partners, we deliver a broad range of conservation initiatives. As the voice of anglers and hunters, and as a leader in fish and wildlife conservation in the province of Ontario, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters mission is to strive to ensure the protection of our hunting and fishing heritage and the enhancement of hunting and fishing opportunities, encourage safe and responsible participation, and champion the conservation of Ontario's fish and wildlife resources, which so enrich our lives. We have a vision, a vision of a future that includes healthy lakes and forests, bountiful fish and wildlife, and opportunities for all Ontarians to share our passion for hunting, fishing, and conservation. In 2006, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and more than 40 partners launched the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, also known as Bring Back the Salmon, a major initiative to restore a self-sustaining Atlantic salmon population to Lake Ontario and its streams. I would like to give a huge shout out of gratitude to our program sponsor, Ontario Power Generation, and a major funder of the Classroom Hatchery Program, the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Without the generous support of these two organizations, this program would not be possible. So, thank you. I hope you'll join me over the next four months as we watch our little fish develop and learn together all about them. In our next video, we'll install our 100 eggs in each of the two tanks. Until then, keep on swimming upstream.